had another teacher for a week or two, or maybe a week off for Thanksgiving. But we are back, and as I understand, you are reading through the great stories of the Bible and thinking about how they hold together to make one big story. And so we are going to come in at the midpoint of that story and think about King David in his worst moment. Um, just to remind you who I am, I'm Kendra Holtz. I'm the director of the Urban and Community Health Concentration at Rhodes College and an assistant professor of religious studies. Um, and last time I was with you, we were thinking about not simply the individual stories, but a sort of model for reading biblical stories. That, and, and I'll just remind you of the scheme there, and it is that we always have to think about three different contexts in order to make sense of any particular story. We have to think about the original context in which the story happened. Second, we have to think about the context in which it was written down. And in some cases, those are multiple contexts. These stories about David would have been collected early in Israel history. They would have been repeated and written later in Israel history. And then they would have been gathered up and put into a final form during the 6th century Babylonian exile. And so when we think about when it was written down, we've got to think about more than one context. And then finally, to make sense of these stories, we have to think about our own context. We have to think about how we tell stories bears on what they mean. Why do we choose to tell them at certain points in our own history? If you remember, I gave the example of the crucible. And at first blush, if I ask you what the crucible is about, most of you answered, it's about the Salem witch trials. And then I said, well, when was it written? Well, it was written during the 1950s. Okay, what is it about? Oh, it's about the Red Scare, right? You don't actually know what the Crucible is about if you only know about 17th century witch trials. You don't really know what it's about unless you also know what it was like to live in that context of fear. If you put on the play The Crucible today, the choices you make about how to cast those accused of witchcraft will tell you more about your own context than it will about when that play was written or about the 17th century witch trials. So here we are reading about King David in what the Bible itself says is his worst moment. And we have to ask, what was going on when David was king? And what was going on in the later history of Israel when people admired David but wanted to know what had gone wrong? And then finally, what was going on in that 6th century context when they're putting these stories into final form? And then for our context, we have to ask, what kind of story are we telling when we are telling the story of a man with great power who abuses that power in horrible ways? And what kind of story are we telling when we're telling stories of sexual violence in which the voice of the woman is not heard at all? When we tell those stories, we have to know as much about our own context as we do about the 6th century or the 10th century or any century in between. Let's gather ourselves with prayer, and then we'll read this old story. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, for you have gathered us in this season of waiting you have filled us with anticipation. You have left us with bated breath. What will come next? How will the story continue? How will we voice that story? O oh, great and gracious God, in this Advent period, make us watchful. Amen. We are in 2 Samuel chapter 11. You've been following the career of David, his meteoric rise 
from the youngest son who was hollered at by his older brothers for coming up to see what was going on in the front lines to his surprising triumph over the giant Goliath. You've watched him become a great general. You've seen him defeat Philistines. You've watched him flee from the wrath of Saul. And you've seen him return in triumph to become king. In chapter 10, we come to the very height of David's power and glory. He has united all of the tribes of Israel. He is recognized as the single king. He has received a promise from God that his kingdom will never end. And then chapter 11, we are poised right at the height of David's greatness. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all of Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. What did you hear? It's spring. It's the season when kings go out to war, and David didn't go. He stayed in Jerusalem. Can we just pause for a minute to think about the season when kings go out to war? <laughs> it was spring. You go to war. Can we also maybe acknowledge that we do that too? I mean, we sort of think of peace as this season when we're waiting for the next conflict. They're just more honest about it. It has warmed up, the ground has thawed, off you go. Okay, it is spring, the season when kings go out to battle, and David sent Joab and all of his armies, but David stayed in Jerusalem. What are you supposed to be thinking about David at this point? Why did he stay? That, that doesn't look right. He's the great general. He's the great warrior. It happened. Late one afternoon, when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house, that he saw a woman, he saw from the roof, a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David didn't go to battle. What was he doing instead? He's taking a nap. <laughs> yeah. He's lazing about on his couch. He's up on the roof of the palace. That's a really nice place to be. You catch the breezes. You've got a great view. If you ever look at the topography of Jerusalem, then you'll see that Jerusalem is built on hills, and the, te the, the temple and the palace are both up on nice hills, and you get this panoramic view of the city. And you also get this really nice view of something else. What are people doing down below in their gardens, on their roofs, in their baths? What is Bathsheba doing on the roof bathing? Is she some kind of exhibitionist? I don't bathe on my roof. I don't have a flat-roofed house. Yeah, if you've ever been to the desert, go, go to Santa Fe. Even just go to Santa Fe, just go to Santa Fe. Um, go to Santa Fe and look at the way the homes are built. In places that are extremely arid, you don't need that pitch on the roof. The pitch on our roofs is to get the water off of them. If you don't get water, don't worry about putting a pitch on the roof. So instead, you have a flat roof with a low wall around it, and that becomes a usable living space, and that's the best place to put your things for bathing. You can have a vat up there that catches water for the occasional rain that you do get. It's private. Think about it. People on the street walking by, looking up, just see the wall. You have to be above looking down to see what anybody's doing on the roof. David's a creepy peeping Tom. I just said that in church. Okay, that's okay. The, I promise it won't fall down. I've done it before. David sent someone to inquire about this woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. David sent someone to inquire. What did he learn? You can tell what he asked, 
by what they told, told him back. She's married. She's, her husband is a warrior. He's away because it's spring, the season when kings go out to battle. She, it's, it locates her socially. She's someone's daughter. She's someone's husband. This is the daughter, wife. <laughs> that was nice. Um, she's, she's the daughter of Eliam. She's the wife of Uriah. And Uriah is a Hittite. You, you don't remember the specifics about who the Hittites are, I don't suppose, because unless you teach this stuff regularly, you don't carry that kind of information around in your head. Right. I find it weird, the stuff that rattles around inside of my head. Somebody does know the Hittites. Who? <laughs> and he's hiding. <laughs> yeah, who are the Hittites? You Yes, now we're horrified. Okay, the, the Hittites are this group that lived in Canaan before the Israelite conquest, and they converted to Yahwism. They are, in other words, resident aliens. They are, in a sense, foreigners. They're not considered sort of ethnically part of Israel, and yet they share the same faith. And so they're held up as these sort of special instances of people who are really faithful. They're not the ones who were promised the covenant. They don't have a kind of obligation in their blood to obey the laws of Moses, and yet they voluntarily take up this strenuous life. So it matters that he's a Hittite because he doesn't have to go to war. He doesn't have to defend Israel. And yet there he is, going to battle. But also notice, who is Bathsheba? The wife of someone, the daughter of someone. Who is Bathsheba? A beautiful woman. Think about that, especially for the women. Don't you have some identity, yes, embedded in your familial relationships, but don't you have some identity that is not simply, I'm this person's wife, I'm that person's daughter? To know me, you really have to know that I'm Glenn's daughter, that I'm Kelly's sister, Kendra's sister, that I'm Matt's wife. You really have to know those things. But if you don't also know that I love Leonard Cohen, and by the way, if you don't know there's a reference to this particular story in one of his songs, then I'll fill you in later, um, th that I adore dogs, that I um, am passionate about racial justice and its implications for the good delivery of health care, that I uh, love teaching, that if you don't know those things, do you really know me? It tells you something about the social context of 10th through 6th century Israel that all you need to know about Bathsheba is that she belongs to someone else. That's what matters about her in this story. She belongs to someone else. My female students tell me that the best way to put off a young man at a party who's coming on a little too strong is to tell that young man, I'm dating someone else. Because he might not respect it if I say, no thank you, I'm not interested but he will respect another man's claim to my body. Think about that. What does that say that young women know that an effective strategy for establishing independence is to pretend to be claimed by another man? These values that we've inherited are embedded in the texts we value. David inquired of this beautiful woman, woman he had been peeping in on and was told what mattered. She belongs to another man. Not, she has bright brown eyes. Not, she's got this funny little cat. Not, she's exceedingly good at needlework. Not, she's a brilliant conversationalist who has strong opinions about your foreign policy. Just, Someone's else got a claim on her. 
So David sent the messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. So he sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. What did David just do? He committed adultery. Anything else? Did she consent? Could she have not consented? Is this a story of rape? Did David rape Bathsheba? How many of you have seen portrayals of Bathsheba that depict her as a seductress? That's a very, very traditional way of telling this story. Have you seen anything in this story that suggests that Bathsheba seduced David? Is it consensual if you can't not consent? Here's the cue. The author of this story is telling us that it's a rape. And we know that because when we meet Nathan the prophet in the next chapter, who calls David out on this behavior, he tells David that what you have done in secret will be done in public. He tells David that the sin you have committed will be replicated in the next generation. Now, the sin against Uriah, you know what happens to Uriah, right? I'm not spoiler alert or anything. Okay, the, the murder and violence against Uriah gets replicated in his own household. The violence against Bathsheba gets replicated in his old, own household. The very next story in this cycle is the rape of David's daughter, Tamar. So the text itself tells us how we should interpret this event. What you have done in secret, the rape of Bathsheba, gets replicated in public, the rape of your own daughter. And so the text is telling us that we should think as badly as we possibly can of David at this point. We'll come back to that in a minute and think, how come, you know, we were on this upward trajectory and everything's fantastic with David, and right when we get to the very high point of his kingship, boom, this is horrible. Why on earth does this author want us to think so badly of David? Remembering that this is the author who believes that David was the man after God's own heart. That this is the author who tells us that God gave David a promise that he would never withdraw his love. This is not an author who wants us to reject David. But it is an author who wants us in the midst of this story to think that this is an outrage. Okay. Uh, verse 5. We're only on verse 5. <laughs> the woman conceived and sent and told David, I'm pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David, and Uriah came to him. And David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. And then David said, go down to your house and wash your feet. Okay, that sentence is hysterical. I'm not sure how many of you know how really, really funny that sentence is. The word feet in Hebrew is a circumlocution for genitalia. So you know those angels who have three sets of wings and with one set they fly and with the other set they cover their eyes and with the third set they cover their feet? They're modest angels. Okay, so David says to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. What's David doing here? I mean, this is a brilliant plan. <laughs> That's right. He's trying to persuade Uriah to go and have sex with his wife so that when the child is born, he'll believe that it's his own child. David doesn't even plan to take responsibility for the child. Okay, so um, Uriah goes from the king's house, but he won't go and wash his feet. 
um, he sleeps instead right outside of the palace. And verse 10, when they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, you've just come home from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, think about how much this must burn given that very first sentence of the story. It was the season when kings go out to war. The ark of Israel and Judah remain in booths, in tents, out in the field. And my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house to eat, to drink, and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. How come Uriah won't go relax and enjoy himself? Yeah, it feels like a betrayal of his brothers in arms, that they're out in the fields, they're doing this hard thing, and why should I be the one to relax? He just said to his king, who was lounging on the couch, peeping on his wife and raping her. Then David said to Uriah, remain here today also, and tomorrow I'll send you back. Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and also the next. And David invited him to eat and drink in his presence, and he made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of the Lord, but he did not go down to his house. So David makes another brilliant attempt, get him drunk. Then surely he will go home and wash his feet. Nope, he won't do it. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. You know this story. What did he tell Joab to do? put him in the front line of battle, but even worse than that, there was something else. Do you remember what else it was? And then pull back, right? Put Uriah in the front of the battle and then pull back from him so he gets killed. In fact, that's not actually what happened. What actually happened was that the fighting got too close to the walls of the city. And that's a dangerous thing because once you get close to the walls of the city, then the civilians can become combatants because they can toss stuff down on top of you. And so it was a tactical error on Joab's part. And the result was that they lost a significant part of the army and Uriah too. So Joab sends a message back to David reporting the tactical error. And he says to the messenger, if the king becomes angry, say to him, Uriah the Hittite was among those who were killed. So the messenger comes back to David and he reports what happened. David is becoming angry. This is a stupid thing to do. How could Joab have made such a mistake? And then the messenger says, and Joab said that I should tell you that Uriah was among those who were killed. And David said, oh, well, these things happen. Right? I mean, he actually says that. He says, um, this is um, verse 25. David said to the messenger, Thus you shall so say to Joab, Do not let this matter trouble you, for the sword devours now one and now another. Press your attack on the city and overthrow it and encourage him. Right? So David said, Oh, these things happen. Right? Sometimes you get killed, sometimes you don't. Moving right along. Okay. So um, Uriah has died, and verse 27, when the morning, morning was over, David sent and brought Bathsheba to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David did had displeased the Lord. Now you've had enough Sunday school, you know what happens, right? Nathan comes and confronts David. And what does, how does Nathan get David to recognize his own error? Do you remember that? Yeah, he tells him a story. There's a rich man with a lot of sheep and a poor man who only has one. And that poor man really loves his sheep. He even brings it into his bed at night. It's kind of a weird dimension of that story, I've always thought. Okay. Um, eh, sometimes we let the dogs jump up on the bed, so who knows, right? Okay. And David said, this is an outrage 
you know, the rich man's going to have to pay the poor man back seven times over. What he did to the poor man, stealing his sheep, will be taken from him in, in multitudes. So, of course, Nathan says, one of the best lines in the Bible, you are the man. You kind of imagine he was just shaking in his sandals at that point, right? I mean, he's confronting power, the likes of which we do not have in our world. We have people with tremendous power, but we don't have people who have the power of a king. A king in antiquity is a whole different kettle of fish in terms of what you can do with power. And Nathan says to him, Nathan is a prophet. The word there is nabi. It means a mouthpiece. He's the one who's speaking on behalf of God. And he's got to say to his king, you are the man. David admits it. David repents. The child Bathsheba bears, dies, and then she bears another son, Solomon, who will become the next king. We'll come to all of that later. But let's just Stay here for a minute thinking about David. And let's think about 10th and 9th century and how that depiction of David is different from a 6th century depiction of David. Okay, get yourselves imaginatively in two different places. First, you are in an ancient kingdom just coming in to stability and power just moved from being a confederation of 12 tribes into a solidified monarchy. First king didn't work out so well. Second king is the one they will always look back to as the golden age, David. And you're telling the story of this greatest hero. And you have watched this meteoric rise. And you are counting on the promise this is the dynasty that will last. And right when you get to the highest point of the story, it all comes undone. And you know some of the things that happened to David right after this, right? You know about the rape of Tamar. Do you remember that one of his sons is named Absalom? Why, what happens with Absalom? And why? Do you remember what happened? Yeah? He, say one more time. He dies in battle. What kind of battle? Yeah, he dies in the midst of a coup against his own father. Absalom tries to take his father's place. He, uh, and, and he's successful for a while. He actually drives David out of the city. And David has to come back and re-win his own throne. And Absalom dies. He's apparently got really great hair. And um, he dies when he's going out to battle and he gets his hair caught in the branches of a tree. And so somebody's able to come and kill him. Well, that's a ridiculous way to die. And, and this poignant story of David's mourning Absalom. You know those lines, right? Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son. The agony of a father who was at war with his son. You don't survive a coup attempt. That was inevitable. David would die or Absalom would die. After David, uh, his son Solomon becomes king. After Solomon becomes king, there is a civil war and the United Kingdom divides into two. Ten tribes in the north called Israel, two tribes in the south called Judah. All the rest of the story is told from Judah's perspective from the two tribes in the south. Now let's think about the period, let's say in the hundred years after David. The period when you don't know if this dynasty will make it forever or not. The period when there's still internal factions. Why would you tell the story about David in this particular way? Meteoric rise, disaster. And everything falls apart after that. Why would you tell the story that way if you lived, um, well, let's take ourselves all the way to exile. 400 years later, 400 years, that's unbelievable that any dynasty could last that long. 
and you have begun to think of it as an everlasting dynasty. Why would you tell this story where David looks just so awful? Can you think about why that might be important? Let's not make the same mistake again. Okay, that's, they're absolutely, it's important from the perspective of the Deuteronomist, that's the sixth century historian, to learn from our history. And they tell Israel's history warts and all. They tell every rotten thing they did. Okay. Any other reason you want to tell this about David? You can make a comeback. God accepts repentance, right? You also need to explain why God is angry. You need to explain the exile. Part of that covenant with David says, I will never take my steadfast love from you and your kingdom will always uh, 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 exist. But there may come times when I punish you using other kingdoms. So you can say to yourself, well, maybe we're being punished the same way God would punish David. God is punishing us. You also, frankly, need an explanation for what everyone knows happened to David's kingdom. David did not triumph and keep 12, king, 12 tribes together forever. David put together a temporary alliance that only lasted one generation after his own death. That's the history, everybody knows it. Everybody knows the 10 tribes in the north were annihilated by the Assyrians in the seventh century. Everybody knows it. You can't pretend that David gave this promise and then nothing ever, that God gave David this promise and then nothing ever went wrong. You have to wrestle with your own history. You have to tell your history with a frank acknowledgement that you have not been ideal. This is a really remarkable thing to confront your own history with that kind of brutal honesty. I was just in Berlin a couple of years ago and all over the city there are these uh, brass uh, I don't even know how to describe them, markers. They're about this big of round, and they're on the ground. And you can walk over them without noticing. And then all of a sudden you realize, what's this brass thing on the ground? And they're all over the place. Have you been to Berlin? Does anybody happen to know what those little brass markers are? They mark the place where the Jews of Berlin lived before the Holocaust. Homes that they were taken from. They're the names of the dead. They're the names of the victims. You can't walk around Jerusalem, I'm sorry, you cannot walk around Berlin without literally stepping on the memories of the dead, without confronting over and over again. My God, we did this. We did this horrible thing. You can walk through most of America and never come to terms with our own history, with what we've done. My cousin lives in Wilmington, North Carolina, a city that at the end of Reconstruction had a black mayor, a black city council. It was about 60% African American, and it was a peaceful, orderly city. It was well run, and it was economically prosperous. And then there was a revolution in which the white citizens rose up and slaughtered the entire city council and the mayor and instituted a new white government. Wilmington to this day is white. My cousin, who's lived there for 15 years, didn't know that story. Where are the markers of what we have done? How much do we confront our own history? How honest are we? Can you pass through Memphis without confronting the ghosts of our own atrocities? This is part of what this historian is doing, making everyone come to terms that even your golden boy, not so golden. Here's the other thing that's going on. You need an explanation for why this great guy made so many incredibly bad mistakes inside his own household. Now, 6th century, it's about conf confronting our big history. 9th century, it's about the fact that there are still political factions in Israel and not everyone is convinced that David is the legitimate king. I'll show you this. This is a cool, cool feature that we often just overlook. 
in the Bible. This is chapter 16, and I don't think you read this part. This is after Absalom has started his revolution, and David is fleeing the city. As David flees the city, he and his armored guard have to pass through this little town on their way to cross over the Jordan. And this guy named Shimei runs out, and this is what he says to David. When King David came to Bahurim, a man of the family of the house of Saul came out, whose name was Shimei, son of Gera. He came out cursing. He threw stones at David and at all of the servants of David. Now all of the people and all of the warriors were on his right and his left, and Shimei shouted while he cursed, Out! Out! Murderer! Scoundrel! The Lord has avenged on you the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. See, disaster has overtaken you, for you are a man of blood. What is Shimei accusing David of? Killing Saul. You're getting as good as you gave. You overthrew the rightful ruler, Saul. And now you are being overthrown. Why would anybody think that David overthrew Saul? Think for a minute. Why would anybody think that? Is David Saul's son? No. How is David related to Saul? He's a general in Saul's army. He married one of Saul's younger daughters. How did David become king? Oh, we're not terribly good at telling this story, are we? We do this too. We clean up the Bible. We don't notice that when David fled from Saul, he went to the Philistines. The Philistines are Israel's enemy. You remember that, right? He took refuge with the enemy, and suddenly the enemy began winning. David staged a coup against Saul and became king. The whole series of stories in which someone who stands between David and the throne dies. And the text goes over and over and over again to tell us David didn't know about it. David didn't have anything to do with it. David wasn't anywhere near there when that happened. Um, one of those guys was a general in Saul's army who was planning to defect. And when the whole thing is over and the guy is dead, um, they come to David and they tell him so-and-so has died. And David's response is, I and my house are forever innocent of the death of so-and-so. I wish I could remember his name so I didn't just have to say so-and-so. I've always told my students, listen, if the cops ever show up on your door and they knock and say something happened to your next door neighbor, don't say, I and my house are forever innocent of whatever happened to my next door neighbor, right? That doesn't look good. It looks like you're building an alibi over and over and over again. If you live in the ninth century, one of the reasons you tell the story this way is partly because there are people who are not persuaded that David is a legitimate ruler. And you need to give an accounting of his legitimacy as a ruler and of why things within his own household went so badly. You can't just cover those things up because everybody knows them. Now, there does come a time when you can tell the story and leave out all the messy details. That time comes in the fourth century in the books of First and Second Chronicles, you read a portion of that today. If you read the story of David in First and Second Chronicles, long time later, 600 years later, exile's been over for 200 years. If you read the story at that point, there is no story of Bathsheba. There's no rape of Tamar. There's no revolution uh, coup attempt on the part of Absalom. All of the messy things about David's kingdom whew, disappear. Enough time passes, and we can all forget our own atrocities. The biblical texts reflect that, and I think we probably all know it in our own lives, too. It's instructive to read these stories really closely and think about how, how is this the word of God for the people of God? 
How did it function in its own period? What did the stories mean in the ninth century? What did these stories mean in the sixth century? What do they mean in the fourth? And is there any way we can learn anything from this old story about the king who didn't go out to war when it was the season for war? Thank you for your time. I'll see you next Sunday.